confident are you that the papers registering your horse are in fact correct? I've bred horses for over 20 years and every year I have pulled hair on the foals, sent them to the lab so that their DNA could confirm their parentage, and yet, like the great majority of people, I didn't know how it worked until I looked into it. So give me 12 to 13 minutes of your time and you will find out and learn something that most horse owner and breeders don't. This here is the body of work of G.R.R. Tolkien and basically the entire history of Middle Earth. And for this analogy, because the analogy are very useful, it's also the genome of your horse. Because in order to understand how DNA parentage testing work, we need to understand or clarify a few things first. In these books is all the information needed to understand the world, the heroes, the whole history of Middle-earth. It's all there, 700,000 words and um, five books. Similarly, all the instruction for the body to form a horse, have it grow and thrive and live, is contained in what we call the genome of the horse. It's all in there, 25,000 genes and 2.7 billion nucleotide pairs distributed in 32 chromosomes, of which each horse has two copies of, so that's 64 chromosomes in all. Now, to push the analogy just a little bit further, chromosomes are like books. And loci, or loci, depending if you use the Latin pronunciation or the English one, are the chapters in this book where you will find some key nugget of information that are found, in the case of the genome, in the forms of genes. Well, the genes themselves are then written in nucleotide pairs, and they're the equivalent of sentences in the text. Now, this is the book of the horse, but humans have a different book. Species that are related have similar book and similar stories, but they're not the same. So we have a lot of our genome in common with the chimpanzee, for example, but their book and our book are still quite different and unique to our own species. But within the species, other than for some small typos here and there that represent less than a fraction of a percentage of the total, two individuals will have fundamentally the same genome, the same story. And yes, of course, a small typo can change the color of the hair or the ability to make a hormone or another. They are important, but they do not change the whole story. Now that we understand this, we can also understand that every horse has the same genome, the same story, the same genes. Just like all the copies in the world of the Cimmerillion, tell the same story with the same words. So if all the horses have the same genome, how can we tell them apart? And how can we check if one horse is related to another then? Let's take a look at these two printing of the Cimmerillion. And if I compare these two editions, let's say we go to page 131. Um, we are in chapter 13 for those of you that follow along. Thorongor king of eagles, mightiest of all birds that have ever been, whose outstretched wings span 30 fathom. Okay, all right. And on this one, page 131, same chapter, obviously. Now, Morgoth, believing the report of his spies that the lord of the Noldor were... This is, this is not the same sentence. What is going on? This is the same book. Well, you see... These are two different editions. And while the same story, it's the same story in the same text, there's clearly a difference here, and it's not just a typo either. The difference between these two editions could be due to different font size, or maybe the format, or perhaps the particular layout. Basically, things that have nothing to do with the story. Well, the same thing applies to the DNA of a horse. The secret of the difference between one horse and another is not in the genes so much as it's in the space between them. So, what is between the gene on the DNA strand? Well, quite a lot, it turns out. By the way, I want to say thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members that are allowing me to do this YouTube thing. Special shout out to Sherelle Louise and Emma K for their top mayor membership support. But everybody watching, everybody contributing just a little bit absolutely helped me research and produce this video. Thank you so much. So the geneticist started sequencing the genome of the horse way back in 2006. And in doing so, they found out that there was a lot of the part of the genome that were clearly not coding for anything. But some of these areas were instead filled with nonsense series of nucleotide, gibberish if you like. And sometime, the gibberish actually repeated, a little bit like a stuttering, 
or a tape on a loop if you want. These segments came to be called polymorphic short tandem repeat, STR for short. And those STR have a set number of repetition that varies from one horse to the other. While not infinite number of possibilities, they found that across whole horses' population, some of these STR could have a range of between 8 and 15 repeats. So they found and they mapped those STR to various chromosomes, and once identified, they were actually very predictable. Because they appear to be somewhat random, and they have no effect on the phenotype or the physiology of the horse, there was no confusing them with genes. It was like knowing exactly why two different editions of the same book could be slightly different from one another. If those repetition in those segments, those STR, could be measured and documented, they could end up being like a fingerprint, able to identify a horse out of all the others. But how can you measure the space between the genes? You, you can't exactly pull out a ruler and measure it. We're talking about things that are at the molecular level here. Well, when a section of DNA has more repeats, it's, well, longer, obviously. And there is a technique in biochemistry called electrophoresis that is used when studying big molecules like DNA. For this method to work, the molecules or molecules uh, need to be separated into sections, chopped up, basically, and then replicated so that there's a significant volume of them to work with. That's the technique called PCR. And then they put those little samples in a slab of a thick gel, and a low electrical potential is put at the bottom and at the top of this gel. In a way, the, then the molecule are kind of forced to move through it by an electrical current. Shorter or longer molecule, or those with different charges or polarity, essentially move faster or slower in this gel, and so they separate as they move, and the geneticists are able to identify as they separate into visually distinct bands. That's what you see in this image here. This can then be calibrated to give the length of a particular strand of DNA. For each STR they found consistently in the same part of the genome, they started looking at the variation, and they identified how many repeat they could have based on how quickly or how slowly they moved through this gel. So, for example, on chromosome 6, they found the spacer EHT4, and they determined that it could vary between 8 or 14 repeat of the nucleotide pair G and T. This became a very useful marker. To make it easier, they started to name these various alleles. They started naming them by the letters of the alphabet. So in this case, we see that this particular horse here has two versions of the marker EHT4. Remember, they all have two copies of everything. One with 10 repeat named J, because it's the 10th letter of the alphabet, and the other one with 12 repeat that it's labeled, well, L. Now, here's the really useful part. These STR are not just random they're inherited. This horse got its J copy from either its dam or sire, and the other version, L, from the other parent. Let's put all this together visually. You remember your Punnett square from high school? Let's build this one. So, we would have a mare, in this case, we have her here, that would have the allele M and J, for example. And we have a stallion here, at the top, that would have the allele L and K for the EHT4 marker. So, if we were to construct the possibility of their offspring, we would have ML here, the mare contributing her M allele, the sire contributing the K, or, in this case, she could have contributed her J allele and the stallion the L, and in this case, the J, and it would have contributed the K. So we can see here that our horse is JL. Turned out of all these four combinations, that's what he ended up with. Now, what if it had a sibling, a full sibling, same pairing? Well, of course, it could also, that sibling, have JL, but it could have any of those combinations, depending on the randomness of the reorganization of the chromosome during its conception. But what would happen if we got a different sire that had exactly the same set of alleles? After all, there's not an infinite number of repeat possible. Then we could mistakenly think that this is the correct stallion while being completely wrong. Now, to be sure, it'd be better if we could use another marker to confirm things. 
Well, even with two markers, it's still statistically possible that you could basically be looking at a fluke and have the wrong parent, but it's getting harder. You can't rely on just one or two marker to exclude a sire as impossible or possible. You see where I'm going with that, right? You need multiple markers. So how many markers do geneticists have to play with to prove the parentage of particular horses? Well, for a marker to be accepted and used by labs from all around the world, they all use the same one, it has to be observed consistently, its various versions documented, and then submitted to an international organization that monitors and catalogs those markers, or STR, to make sure that they're valid and robust as markers. Interestingly enough, there's a yearly competition where the labs are challenged on the accuracy of their testing, making sure that they can narrow down the right segment and correctly assess the number of repeat present. Now, to be clear, this DNA parentage test can only work if both of the presumed sire and dam's DNA profile over those marker has already been documented. Then the foal's DNA can be compared to its parent to see if it's a match. It's the main reason why my new mare, for example, that I bought just a few months ago, cannot be registered. You see, her sire DNA markers can't be located. They've gone missing. They're, they're somewhere, but we can't find them. And unfortunately, because he died a few years ago, we can't redo his DNA profile at this point. So far, there's 17 STR that are commercially available, giving each parentage test the accuracy needed should some of the comparison prove to be negative or maybe inconclusive. So how does this look like? Every horse that gets its DNA profile done will have both of its allele indicated for each marker. It will look a little bit like this, for example. Now, to determine if a foal is in fact the product of a pairing of a particular mare and a particular stallion, punnet squares are going to be made for all markers and compared to the result of the foals. Of course, all this is now done by computer and it goes very quickly. But take a look at this example here, where we have the comparison with the sire's list of allele, the dam's list of allele, and then the foal. And yes, this happens to be a match. If the majority of the foal's marker can be traced to either its dam and its sire, then yes, there is a match. That is why you can't just ask the genetic lab to find the parents. That would be impossible. The test works by comparison. So you need to provide the lab with some choices. Most of the time, the dam is known, but it's the sire that could be in question. But in either case, you need to propose parents, and the test will then tell you if that parentage is possible probable or impossible. Statistically, however, when 12 markers or more are unable to eliminate the parent as a possibility, it means that there is a more than 99.9999% chance that the parents are in fact the correct ones. In other words, if we look at the other way, the, <laughs> the reverse, once you have 12 markers confirming that the proposed parentage is possible, the opposite that it's a fluke and or that it's the wrong parent, that chance is now so small that it's practically not important. Now, with new technology becoming more available to labs around the world, there's another method that is now starting to take over. Instead of looking for multiple repeats, this new analysis is able to find a single nucleotide change in a particular section of the genome. It's very precise. And that is a way to build a different kind of fingerprint for horses that is getting used more and more. This particular thing that they're looking at are called single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP, or SNP in the common parlance. I won't get into it in this video, and I'll leave that for another day, but this change is being rolled out in the next few years for most of the horse registry. So we have STR and we have SNP. So now when you read about a genetic profile or the fact that there's a match or not and they mention STR or SNP, you will know what they're talking about. Now, earlier I did mention how some slight difference in a gene, a mutation, is a very small part of the genome. And so it can be relatively useless to determine parentage but it can have a big impact on this particular horse. Now, some mutations are hidden and their effect can be very subtle, while others are very obvious. If you're curious to find out how mutation can have a visual impact on horses, 
Watch this video next. It's part of a whole series of videos that I did on the visual impact of some of these key mutations. Anyway, thank you so much for watching.